I want to thank Bishop Mike for the opportunity. It's always a great joy to be here. He's an elder statesman in the body of Christ, and we cherish and honor him uh, for his life and, and what he continues to be to us. Um, last year, when I was here during this, this session, I, I, I did a, something on God Has Spoken and I tried to uh, work with biblical uh, interpretation and, and how to interpret the Bible, how to treat the Bible. Uh, so I'm going to go along the same tangent. Uh, so it means I'm, I'm doing year by year teaching on that. <laughs> um, and the reason I'm doing that is, um, you know, we, we are charismatics. Um, and charismatism uh, is the youngest Christian expression. Uh, charismatism as a, as a Christian expression started uh, somewhere in the, probably in the late, middle to late 1960s, uh, flourished in the 70s and, and the 80s. Uh, the 70s and the 80s would be the peak of charismatism. Uh, that is when most Africans also got to receive the charismatic message. Uh, and then the 90s uh, came in and we are now in the 2000s and charismatism is beginning to look a little, uh, um, it's taking on a different form, especially in Africa. Uh, so I feel compelled sometimes to address issues that are within the charismatic space because not to condemn, but to help us to understand where we are and, and, and the dangers ahead of us so that our movement is not derailed and our movement is not destroyed. Um, but because it is the youngest uh, of the Christian expression, you have to understand that Christianity is about 2,000 years old. That is Christianity with Christ. But if you add the Old Testament to it, uh, it's longer than that. Um, Jesus Christ is, uh, is supposed to have been born based on historical calculations, either BC 4, that is four years before the end of that session, or AD 4. So within that time, somewhere, Jesus was born. And if that is it, then Jesus Christ died somewhere uh, around probably AD 27 uh, onwards, somewhere around that time. If you take that time frame, then Christianity is just around 2,000 years from the day of Pentecost to now. And 2,000 years is a very long time. It's a very, very, very long time uh, in, in human terms. It's very, very long. Uh, so we, we have to understand that we belong to an ancient faith. And when I say we belong to an ancient faith, it, it, Christianity didn't start last year. And it didn't start last two years. <clears throat> and it didn't start through the people we know now. We know Bishop Mike. We know uh, Pastor Deboe. We know Oral Roberts. Uh, we, we know all of these people. But as old as they have been in the ministry, Christianity was there before they came. Christianity was there before their fathers was, was born, before their grandfather was born, before their great-grandfather was born, before there was a country called Nigeria, before even the old kingdoms in this part of the world were established Christianity is very 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 old so when we are talking about Christianity or we are teaching one of the first things we have to remember we are not the first people to be Christians and we are not talking about a faith that is now defining itself we are talking about a faith that has been here for 2,000 years and almost everything you think is new has already been thought of sometime in the 2,000 year period of Christianity so sometimes when people come up as if they are teaching something new because I am a historical Christian and I'm filled a historical theologian I listen to what they're saying and I can put it into where it was spoken maybe 500 years ago 1200 years ago which we we may call it revelation but some of it is old discredited heresies that was put into the dustbin of Christianity that people went to the dustbin brushed it and brought it and because we haven't heard it before it sounds very fresh to us but it's not fresh at all. It's, it's very, 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 very old. And most of it discredited. Now, it's very important because most of us grew as Christians knowing men of God and not the word of God. So we know men of God. And our reference to Christianity is men of God. So and so said this. So and so said that. And, and that's our reference point. And the other thing that 
a, a lot of charismatics have done people have written books many leaders have written books and insist that their followers read only their books and so we become masters and champions of the books of people but we know very very little of the word of god because most of the books actually may not be properly interpreting the word of god and and that creates serious problems for us as christians at the end of the day uh we have to know the bible and we have to know how to interpret the bible and since this is supposed to be a pastor's meeting if you are not a pastor and you are here you have get crushed into a pastor's meeting but i will treat you like a pastor i hope you are following me uh, this is supposed to be pastors and leaders so if you you came in and you are not one of them i'm not going to speak to you like a normal congregation i'm going to speak to you like you are a serious theologian is that okay all right now so if i say something you don't understand i would say that you brought yourself to the wrong meeting because this is supposed to be for pastors and i'm so i'm going to treat you like that all right okay so there there are a few words i want to uh talk about and then probably we can make some progress from that can you please bring this forward uh, everybody say inspiration okay so inspiration is the means by which god revealed himself to people to record his word and make it known to us so the bible says holy men receive the word of god through inspiration inspiration simply means god breathed god breathed his word into them and there are different theories on inspiration but i'm not going to go into it so inspiration is very important inspiration Then the second word I want to talk about is revelation. Can we please say revelation together? Say please. Revelation. In Ghana we say Shin, you say Sean here. That's still T-I-O-N. Revelation. Inspiration, revelation. Revelation is what God has told us about himself. So we say that the Bible is God's revelation. The Bible is God's revelation now in theological terms this word is a very technical word it cannot be used differently from what it means it, revelation comes from God it comes from God and and generally we say that um, in revelation there is general revelation general and there is special revelation what does that mean that means god has revealed himself in two ways he has revealed himself generally and he has revealed himself specially when we say god has revealed himself generally we mean that the general way people know god when you look at the stars the moon the the creation you see god in it so if you look at what god has created we see him he reveals himself generally to all people that is why everywhere in the world there is a general knowledge of god everywhere in the world in african traditional worship there is a general knowledge of god in ancestral worship there's a general knowledge of god our ancestors knew god but they had a general knowledge of him if you study all religions have a general knowledge of god that means they have a, a knowledge of god and it's it's broad and you can see that that knowledge is shared by most people almost every place every religion believes that there is a supreme being there is a creator that he created all things and they have a certain sense he likes this he doesn't like that he doesn't want us to lie he doesn't want us to cheat he doesn't want us to kill that's a general revelation of god and that is known by all human beings but christians believe that there is a special revelation that god whom we know generally has given us a more specific knowledge of himself a more direct knowledge of himself and that is the special revelation and the special revelation for the christians is captured in what we call the bible so the bible is not a general revelation the bible is a special revelation my culture has general revelation of god but in the bible i find specific or special revelation now this word is very important and the reason I hack on it is sometimes we use the word revelation to mean what we are saying. 
so so maybe when i preach uh, and and people like my preaching they will say wow pastor that's a revelation i understand what they are saying they are using the wrong word to describe the right thing the, the my word is not revelation my word no matter how powerful it is it is not revelation my word will become interpretation uh, i hope i'm inter inter p <laughs> interpretation okay all right so god inspired out of inspiration comes revelation and from revelation is interpretation so interpretation is when i take god's revelation and try to explain what it means so when i preach when every pastor preaches they are doing interpretation of god's revelation they are not making their own revelation because revelation comes from god we interpret revelation so when somebody says i got a revelation or what i'm teaching you is revelation i understand what they are saying i understand what they are saying but i have to be careful that i don't confuse it with god's revelation what they're doing is interpretation now from interpretation we have something else that is called illumination illumination now illumination is when the holy spirit makes interpretation alive without illumination interpretation can be very stiff and that is why sometimes there are people who are theologians they've got phd in whatever they do the greek and when they interpret the bible to you you sit down and say hmm whew. but you, it's like the thing is dead you, you you feel like what they are teaching is dead it has no life it has no application you, you don't see anything and most of the time it is because there is no illumination to it let me show you the difference it's like watching a football match on television now if you follow the uh, football uh, you're watching maybe english premier league uh, for any of the teams i'm not going to mention any name to get into trouble but any of the teams are playing and you're watching them and maybe you follow one of the teams and they are your favorite teams or if you like athletics you are watching the olympic games or if you like boxing you are watching somebody fight or if you like golf you are watching golf or whatever it is you're watching and you enjoy and you know your team from watching them on tv then one day you travel to england and go to the stadium of the team and watch them play and then you realize watching tv as great as it is is not the same as being at the stadium that's the difference between interpretation and illumination interpretation is you are watching tv illumination you are in the stadium you the holy spirit now brings the word alive to you and that is why you feel like wow i can almost feel it the same way inspiration came from god that same holy spirit has brought illumination but the holy spirit does not bring us illumination by itself he has to use interpretation to bring illumination because if you have illumination without interpretation most likely you will get into error that means that you feel good about it but it is wrong interpretation is what ensures that it is right illumination is what ensures that it impacts you so when i read the word it impacts me it it, it gives me something of the spirit for me to know wow this word is alive that's illumination but illumination must be based on interpretation interpretation must be based on god's special revelation god's special revelation comes through inspiration i hope you get it the final step is application 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 is when the rubber meets the road it is when the inspired revelation of god is well interpreted we receive illumination and now it is applied to our lives so that is when examples are given and you are able to see the word become real in our lives now a lot of preachers especially charismatics jump from 
God's word revelation, special revelation word, and instantly go into application. So, for example, they'll read, uh, let me give an example. So you read maybe and you say, uh, uh, let's say, uh, God told uh, um, somebody, or I'm trying to get something that is very direct. And um, so maybe you, 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 you talk about a miracle of Jesus. And you say, and Jesus turned water into wine. That's revelation. That's God's word. It's in the Bible. And then you come in and say, today God is going to turn your life around. Now, when I do that, I've taken revelation. I've jumped interpretation. I've jumped illumination. I'm doing application. In doing that, I may not apply the word the way it is supposed to be applied. So instead of jumping straight from word to application, you have to take your time to do it interpretation allow the holy spirit to illuminate and then we do application i hope i hope you get it now a lot of charismatic preaching is what i call a jumping preaching jumping not because the pastors are preaching but they are jumping the steps so very little interpretation because interpretation requires several processes and i will probably i hope you get these five all right so inspiration brings revelation revelation has to be interpreted and then the holy spirit brings illumination before we apply it before we see how to use it how to use that text uh, from the word of god now when we're doing interpretation of the bible okay let me just clean all of this okay so now i'm going to do interpretation so god has spoken we know god has spoken he has inspired his word he has revealed his word but what did he say what did he say and what did he mean because what he said and what he meant may be very very different from how you understand it now, interpretation of the scripture is a very difficult process and the reason is because there are gaps that we have to deal with first there is a language gap language there is time or history there is context whom it was addressed to so what what do we mean by okay time history let me put culture what do we mean by language language changes this is the year 2024 even from when i was young till now the meaning of words like hot and cold and cool have all changed when in my time when we say something is hot it means it will burn you but today for some people when they say something is hot it means that it is hip it is not it is fashionable it is it is beautiful it's great so they say oh that's hot that's a hot car now when i was growing up when they say the car is hot it means don't touch it it will burn your hand but now it means open it examine it it's nice so just in my lifetime the usage of a word like hot has changed cool has changed so many words keep changing that is in english so can you imagine that i am reading something now based on king james english that was written in the 1600s 1612 thereabouts king james english if in my lifetime words have changed can you imagine how much even in the english words have changed since the time of king james till now but then you also have to understand that the king james english the english then was translated from latin so it came to english from latin 
so for me to even understand what is in the king james the latin is a language barrier because they're doing english from latin but the latin itself came from greek so the bible in the new testament is in english it is goes to latin the vulgate and then it goes through different kinds of uh, words and then i look at the english and now i'm living in 2024 so my a simple word can shock me in terms of how its meaning has changed over the time if i'm reading the old testament it's even more ancient i go to hebrew which at a point was uh, a lost language and was later recovered so there are all kinds of language issues you are dealing with that is why serious theologians always study languages because it's important to understand what god said because what god said he didn't say yesterday he said 2,000 years ago, or he said it 6,000 years ago, or he said it 4,000 years ago, he said it 3,000 years ago, and he said it to a people at a time in the language they were using at the time. Now, I don't live in that time. I have to figure out what it means. All right. So there is a language gap that we are all trying to deal with. Then there is time. There is time. There is history, the history of the place. There is culture which has changed tremendously. And there is context, what is happening at the time. So every preacher is a bridge builder. Preaching is like building a bridge. What kind of bridge are you building? You are building a bridge from what God spoke at the time. God spoke here. And the people are here. They need the word of God now. They need application of the word of God. I am supposed to take the word of God across the bridge of language, across the bridge of time, across the bridge of history, across the bridge of culture, across the bridge of context, and say that the God who spoke at this time is still, still speaking to us now. And what he said at this time, this is what it means for us today. Preaching is bridge building. If you miss the process of bridge building, you may excite people, but you would also mislead them. Because you can end up with applying or application that is not rooted in the proper interpretation of the revealed word of God, which came to us through inspiration. Now, some people would say, well, pastor, I understand all this, but I believe the Holy Ghost is the one who reveals truth to us uh, there are people who believe that what they preach is a mystery and so they believe they are preaching mysteries that god only revealed to them i i sympathize with their ignorance uh, but um, god is not revealing mysteries to anybody again and i'll say it again god is not revealing mysteries to anybody and god is not speaking by revelation to anybody god's revelation is closed he's not adding revelation he's not subtracting revelation it is closed it is called the canon of scripture the canon of scripture is the hebrew tanakh or the hebrew old testament that made, is made up of the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Closed. No addition to it. Jesus Christ himself recognized it as closed. No revelation. The New Testament revelation was put down by the apostles or people who wrote on behalf of the apostles. That's it outside of the apostolic era of all those who knew jesus christ personally including paul who was accepted by those who knew jesus christ personally no revelation of the new testament has come so revelation is closed i hope you're getting me i said revelation is closed that is christianity because the moment you have an open and continuous revelation, you are going to get into cults and occults and sects that are pseudo-Christians. 
The reason why uh, there is Jehovah's Witness is because they believe in continuous revelation. So they believe that their founder also received revelation. Or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints also believe that their prophet received revelation. The moment we, we confer revelation to a person, it means what they say has the validity of scripture. Because the only thing that is revelation is scripture. So therefore, I know when people say, I, I sometimes, you know, we just, oh, that's a nice revelation. We, we use it casually, not in a technical sense. But in a technical sense, revelation is cut, boxed. Our job is not to bring new revelation. Our job is not to receive mysteries from God. Our job is to go to the revelation of God that starts from Genesis and ends in the book of Revelation. We go to the revelation of God and interpret it. And as we interpret it, we trust the Holy Spirit to bring illumination through the interpretation. If I go outside to claim that what I have received is fresh and has no validity in God's revelation, then I am not practicing Christianity. No matter how, no matter how powerful I am, no Christian leader is receiving mysteries from God. The mystery... Paul said, the mystery which was hidden and is now revealed. God reveals mystery and his revealed mystery is the Bible. Now you can say that you got a new insight or you got a new understanding or you got a fresh understanding of a verse, of a concept in the Bible, but you cannot claim that that is a mystery God has revealed to you. If God revealed to you, you are saying now that you have the state of, of, status of a canonical writer. And that is a very major, major, major no-no. So, I don't bring new revelation. God reveals no mysteries to me. I teach things that people tell me, oh, that is, I've never seen that. Yeah, all I did is interpret. That's all. I'm, all that's, everything I'm doing is interpreting what the text says, what the document says. Christians, therefore, you know, sometimes... And it happens a lot with charismatics. People say, I just want to wait on the Lord for the Lord, Lord to bring me a word. I, I, I appreciate that. I also do it. But any illumination that bypasses interpretation can land you into trouble. Because if I'm just praying, 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 or go to a mountain, pray, 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 and then something drops in my spirit, as we say, just dropped. Just, the Lord just dropped it. Who, how do we know it was the Lord? You can just say something triggered something inside of me but we cannot take your experience as validity for doctrine your experience is your experience you were praying and you felt like cold maybe some something just poured water on top of your neck i don't know i don't know you felt something and thank god for how you felt and how many days you fasted thank god you came up you've lost some weight and we thank god for your life but i cannot take all of that as validation for anything if it's jumps interpretation because once illumination jumps interpretation of scripture we are into dangerous waters and i think one of the biggest challenges of the charismatic movement is people avoid god's revelation claim illumination but the illumination they have has no basis in biblical interpretation and once we do that, we will be churning heresies upon heresies upon heresies with absolute confidence. And the fact that somebody speaks confidently doesn't mean he's right. The reason interpretation is important is that when somebody is doing interpretation, all of us can judge what he's doing. Because all of us have the same textbook. So if I come and I'm teaching something, you should be able to examine if these things be so if these things be so that's what the early christians would do when when paul would go to a place and teach the, the believers there would also pick the scriptures and say can can this thing be interpreted this way is the way paul is interpreting it right is the way peter is interpreting it right does it it does it make sense and they were able through the scriptures to interpret the scriptures that christ jesus christ was indeed the promised messiah and that led to the growth of christianity but everything they taught was subject to scrutiny why because everybody had the basis for analyzing what is said listen to me we must not build a christian christianity where concepts are not subject to scrutiny 
that will create fanatics crazy people we already have enough craziness going on we must not add to it very crazy people very crazy i was just having having a uh, uh, a chat with bishop to the bismarck and we're talking about somebody you know who uh, lost his wife a pastor and all of a sudden ladies are coming in and everyone some not everyone but claiming god has spoken to them there's revelation he's the one and one, one of them even had the audacity to say it was good that the wife died because god had a, a plan you know, and all of that and i said where where how are we manufacturing this craziness in the church you know why we are manufacturing craziness because we are not interpreting scripture we are encouraging illumination everybody comes and says god spoke to me god spoke to me the greatest hazard of the charismatic church is god spoke to me it is the most hazardous statement god spoke to me you know why it's hazardous because it is very subjective and very personal so somebody will come god says i should marry you god says i should do it. god says you should do that god told me this god told me that so there is no basis for judging remember paul told the corinthian church when somebody even prophesies others should sit listen and judge it why because they understood that what he's saying is not god speaking he's bringing a word supposedly from god but how do we know we only know when it is judged doctrinal judgment judgment of illumination now the fact that somebody has interpreted the bible doesn't mean that they are, everything they've said is accurate i have views of the bible that people may not agree with and i'm open to debate i'm open to scrutinize i'm open to scrutiny it's just like in the university if you if you put out a theory you there's peer review the others will come and review and and and, and, and eventually you have a more accurate knowledge coming out because other people have the opportunity to contribute to it add to it make it better and so on and so forth but we are claiming a certain divine status which makes it so difficult that when somebody says god showed me a mystery we don't touch it we don't touch it but god inspires revelation revelation is interpreted illuminated and applied and for all of us who are pastors i i just want to encourage you it's it's a little difficult to go through this process when you are preaching especially young preachers everybody who is a young preacher i just want to encourage you develop the discipline of biblical interpretation I'm going uh, pretty soon i'm trusting god to write a book on that uh, i just put out a book on foundation the uh, doctrines of the christian faith it's uh, the first volume is out it's on god jesus christ and the holy spirit the second will be man sin and salvation and then we're going to do something on the trinity and do something on uh, on the church and all of that major uh, doctrines of the christian faith and after that i want to do a, something serious on interpreting the scriptures and give you all the concepts how ancient christians have interpreted the scriptures why did how did paul interpret the scripture how did peter interpret the scripture how did the church fathers interpret the scriptures how did they con come to these conclusions about the christian faith and how can we learn from their systems of interpretation to apply to how we also interpret the scripture anytime we encounter the scripture but if you are a pastor at least all I'm going to tell you is these days it's very easy to get information. If you go on YouTube and you type in interpreting scriptures, I mean, there will be a lot of rubbish and a lot of that, but you, if you just sift through, you'll get a very, couple of very good uh, people who teach on interpreting the scripture. Uh, if you even Google, you will get systems for interpreting the scripture. Make sure that when you are preaching the word of God, your interpretation of it is right don't jump to application because application makes people feel good you know and it's good for people to feel good but we before we jump to ap application we have to make sure that we are rightly interpreting the word of truth i hope you've been helped today and and uh, we would be more studious as pastors if you get crashed into our pastoral conversation today i'm sorry for you for for taking you into a place where you didn't see much application because we were talking about interpretation god bless you The professor has spoken again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doc.
thank you you've always been bringing clarity to a lot of things and we do truly appreciate you thank you he's going to be speaking tonight again with two dogs so put your hands